Okay, it is 1131, so we're going to go ahead and start. Hey, Happy New Year to you too. So yeah, let's go ahead and start. Welcome to this new Bible study and new year. Happy New Year 2023. Can you believe it? I have been teaching here, Bible study here at GCE for lovely ladies like you since 2017. So this is my sixth year doing this. And I think Janine and Jackie and Cindy are probably the original members <laughs> going way back then when we used to meet at Building 71 in the conference rooms there. And I have to admit, when I first started this online, when we all went remote in 2020, I thought it was going to be the end of it because that's how I am. I'm negative like that. But the Lord said, no, this is even going to be better. And it has been. It's expanded. I have taught ladies all over the country, you know, and so this has just been such a blessing that we ended up moving remotely because I don't know if you remember, Janine, I used to have so much trouble finding a conference room and I would get it booked for the whole year and we'd show up there for our lunchtime study and someone, a group of people would be meeting in there and we'd have to wait. And <laughs> there were so many times when the devil was like attacking me in you know, spiritual warfare and I would get so bummed out. But you know what? Going remote has actually been even better because now more ladies can attend rather than going to the building. So it's such a blessing and an honor to teach God's word here at GCE. It is just amazing. So we're going to start this new study. I welcome you. We have some new ladies joining us. So I welcome you and I record these for my YouTube channel. So if you do happen to miss one of them, you can always go back to the YouTube channel and view them later. So, and you know, don't worry if you have to log off because you get a phone call or something, it's perfectly fine. We're just, I'm just so glad that you're here. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, thank you for your many blessings, especially providing us with your word. It's complete, it's beautiful, it changes our lives, it illumines our hearts and our eyes to you. And I thank you for the seven I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And for each lady here joining us, Lord, and those who will come in the future, that you would bless them with every spiritual blessing for taking time out of their day to seek you and to learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. So this is our new study. Oh, sure, Debbie, it's, it's, my, it's my calling. It's my pleasure, but thank you. Uh, so this new study is called Seek Him, and it's based off of a prayer journal that I just wrote. It's available for pre-order today on Amazon. The ebook is. The paperback will come out in the first week of February, I believe. No, actually, probably later this month. And then the ebook will come out first week of February. So. It's called Seek Him, 25 Prayers of Hope, and it's based on the seven I am sayings of Jesus. And so I thought it'd be fun to just teach you some of the lessons here for these seven weeks. It's a nice transition from Malachi because Malachi is the last book written in the Old Testament, remember, and God was admonishing his people, but there was a remnant who still feared him. And he hinted at the coming of the Messiah. And then we had 430 years of silence. And then Jesus came. So I taught a one-day lesson about the Christmas story. And in that lesson, we learned a lot about who Jesus is and why he came and why he had to prove that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. And so this is great in that John, the Gospel of John, is a nice segue from studying Malachi and the Christmas story. Because it is the Gospel of John where Jesus proves to the Jewish people around him, the Jewish leaders, that he is Messiah. So I'm glad that you're joining me as we look at the I am sayings of Jesus. In this study, I wrote my lessons from my upcoming prayer journal and also <clears throat> from Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, Knowing Christ. And I have a more in-depth Bible study called Knowing Christ that I did a few years ago. So if you want to go even deeper into the book of John and these sayings, you can go to the YouTube channel and watch the recordings of that Bible study that I did, I believe 2018, 2019. 
here at work, and it's called Knowing Christ. And that is a real in-depth expositional look. But we're going to look at the I Am Sayings more from a life application approach in this study, this seven-week study. But as usual, those of you who know me, uh, I like to make sure that we put the scripture in proper context. And we do that by asking the journalistic questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So who, who wrote the book? The book of John was written by the beloved disciple of Jesus, John. And although written primarily for the Gentile nations, we will see that this account is most meaningful to Jewish believers in Jesus. What? Well, it was written differently than the other Gospels in that it doesn't begin with the genealogy of Jesus or a detailed telling of his birth. Instead, it focuses on the deity of Jesus. Why was it written? John's writing seems to point more to the actions of Jesus and his words rather than on the expositional background or narrative details of his birth and life. So after reading this concise book, it's, it's shorter. After reading this concise book, Jewish believers were told of just some of the acts of Jesus while he lived. But those acts were very specific and meaningful to the Jewish believers. There are some events depicted in John that do not appear in the other Gospels, like the woman at the well encounter, Jesus calling himself Messiah, and the death resurrection of Lazarus. And these seven I am sayings. Where and when the seven I am sayings of Jesus happened during the three-year ministry of Jesus in and around Jerusalem. And how is it written? John's gospel is written as an account provided for believers. It's not John saying, it's not written in first person. It's written about Jesus. Okay, so that's how it was written. So that's making sure we're keeping it in proper context. So these are the I am sayings that we will be studying. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, ending with I am the true vine. So these are the ones that we will be looking at over the next seven weeks. And we're going to start today with I am the bread of life. So welcome to lesson one. I love bread. Don't you love bread? That picture makes me so hungry for lunch. <laughs> John chapter six, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Perfect provisions. That's what we're going to look at today. Perfect provision, provisions of Jesus. There is great power in words. And it's no accident that God chose to create using words. If we learn anything about study, about God from studying his attributes, he loves words. He could have just snapped his fingers and everything was created. No, he chose to communicate with us through words. And because we were created in his image, we also love words. But as you know, words can either build us up or tear us down. There is great power in words. And Jesus said to, to those standing before him, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the manna from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. So that must have made them scratch their heads and go, huh, what? This is Joseph's son. Why is he saying the father, my father gives you? I don't understand. It's because they were very literal people back then. And Jesus had a way of teaching using figurative language. And here he was using language saying he was the true bread from heaven. Was he literally bread? No. <laughs> but they were talking literal bread from the time of Moses. He's now taking them to the figurative saying, that was me. That was me given to you during that time. So. You can see how Jesus, the way he taught, was so different than the way they were used to hearing it. So all of this happened during the time of the Passover. And when Jesus called himself the bread of life in John chapter 6, it was very significant for the people gathered there. His words reminded them 
of a time when God had provided during the time of wandering in the wilderness. He took them back to the time of Moses. Why? Because Moses was the prophet. He is the considered the greatest prophet. And so Jesus is now taking them back to that time, a time of remembrance, because they were in the middle of celebrating the Passover. And the Passover was a time of remembrance of how God had provided his people a deliverer, Moses. So now they're, they're looking at him like, oh, okay, he's, he's talking about the Passover. Well, we're celebrating the Passover. I get it. Well, what he's trying to tell them is a greater prophet has come. Someone who is even greater than Moses. And that takes us all the way back to our study in Malachi that we did last month, where God was hinting that a messenger would come first, and that's John the Baptist. He said, the messenger would go before me, he said. So all of the words that John chooses to use or chose to use in the Gospel of John have meaning, very specific meaning. They're very uh, symbolic more so to the Jewish person than to us, because we don't celebrate the Passover. <laughs> We're Gentiles. We, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do communion, but we no longer have to abide by the feast. Well, the Jewish people do. And so this is a chance for Jesus to stand before them and say, I am even greater than the prophet Moses. He is Jesus, Messiah, and they were waiting for the Messiah. Now we tend to worry, don't we? I know I do. I worry a lot. I have anxiety. And there are times when I wake up in the middle of the night in pure panic. I'm sweaty. I'm breathing hard because of something I forgot to do or something that I still need to do. And I start with the what if saying, you know, what if this happens? And what if that doesn't happen? And, ah. and so I have to calm myself down and I say, Ruth, there's nothing you can do about it now. So go back to sleep. And I do. But we tend to worry and have anxiety when we feel we have no control over something. So keep that in mind as we study this. Now, the people at that time when Jesus stood before them were under oppression. They had great anxiety. They were oppressed by Rome. And they had just come through a horrific time in their history of great oppression. They had uh, Alexander the Great, who rose into power, and then he, he died and his generals took over. And his generals oppressed God's people tremendously. One of his generals even erected a statue of Zeus in the temple and uh, sacrificed a pig there in the temple. And then they had the great attack with the Maccabees fought off the um, Alexander the Great's uh, generals. And that's when the time of the great miracle that happened in the temple and why they celebrate Hanukkah, the festival of lights. God had provided the oil. So they had just come off this horrific time of oppression by the Persians and then the Greeks. And then the Romans came along, and now they're still under oppression. Now, the Romans were a little better in that they allowed them to have a king, King Herod. They allowed them to rebuild the temple. It took 20 years, but they have this magnificent temple. And they allowed them to worship their God. They still had to acknowledge Caesar, but they still, the Romans allowed them to worship their own God in their own way. So they had a little bit more freedom. But they were also being oppressed by the religious leaders of their time. The religious leaders kept adding and adding to God's word, to God's law, lording it over the people. So you had oppression coming from the Jewish leaders, and then you had oppression coming from the Romans. So they had constant anxiety of doing something wrong, to be thrown into a Roman prison or kicked out of the temple, not able to worship God. So when here comes this young man, 30-something years old, born to Mary and Joseph, standing in front of them saying, my father gave you the true bread from heaven. He's starting to say these unusual things 
that were making them wonder, what? And he spoke to the people at the time of the Passover, very significant. He was reminding them about how God had provided for them and their ancestors during that time. And it was a time when they had no control over anything. It was a great time of oppression by the Egyptians at that time, too. So he's reminding them of their slavery in Egypt and how it was God who provided for them a deliverer and during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And now he's saying, God has heard your voices again and he has come. So he is about to make the big announcement that he is better, but he also had to prove that he was better, a better deliverer, a better provider, and that he was Messiah, is Messiah. So God used Moses to save his people, but a better prophet, a better savior has come. Jesus showed them that he was the answer to their prayers of deliverance. So he had started his ministry and we saw him turn in the early chapters of John. He turned the water into wine. He had uh, met with Nicodemus. He had walked on the water and he was doing, he provided the uh, food for the, these, the five loaves of bread and the two fishes. So he was doing miraculous things up until this point. And so Jesus was all about showing them and proving to them that he was the better deliverer, the better prophet, that he is Messiah. In the Gospel of John, Jesus proved that he is greater by his miracles. Now, Moses did some great things. He tapped the rock and the water flowed. He stood up to Ramses. He um, parted the Red Sea, right? And he uh, prayed to God and manna came from heaven and provided food for the people. So Jesus had to do better than that as Messiah. So Jesus proved he was the true bread that God provided for his people in the wilderness. He's saying, yeah, remember that manna that came down? That was me. And as we go through the book of John, we're going to see that he did even greater things than Moses. Provisions are something that we need, right? And sometimes we tend to rely upon ourselves for those provisions. I know I have many, many times. But here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is challenging us to let him provide for us. And, and when I think of that, that's when I don't wake up in panic <laughs> in the early mornings of the hours. I pray. And I am reminded of how God has provided for me all my life. I love to look back over my life and remember how he provided. Times when I scratched my head and wondered, where is this money going to come from? We went a whole year without medical health insurance when our son was five years old. That was a scary year because we had no money. And my husband had just started. Uh, he was working two part-time jobs. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I remember being on my knees in prayer a lot during that year, hoping and praying that nothing bad would happen to us or our son. I love looking back and seeing how God answered prayers. And that was Jesus' purpose in saying this saying, I am the bread of life. That was me in the desert that provided for you. But I'm about to give you even better bread, bread that leaves you satisfied for all eternity. And that's the lesson we need to learn. So when you do have those times of doubt and you're thinking, how are we going to pay these bills? How are we going to give get food? How are we going to have clothes? I need a new car. I need this. I need that. When we ask Jesus to provide that peace that passes all understanding, he does. He wants us to slow down. And remember, like the people in Malachi did, remember, the remnant stopped, they gathered together, those who feared God, and they created a book of remembrance. And in that book, they wrote down all the things that God did for them. That is where the peace that passes all understanding comes from. God doesn't change. 
He remains the true bread from heaven. He provided for his people in the wilderness for 40 years. But remember, that manna rained down. It only provided temporary satisfaction. <clears throat> Jesus was about to provide them eternal satisfaction. His words revealed much about himself and God in that he understood the law. He understood the word because, after all, he is the word, right? That's how John begins. In the beginning was the word. So he understood that they were in the scriptures since the age of five. They had to be in God's word, studying the scriptures. So where would he begin? Would he say, look at that tree over there. It provides you fruit. No. Would he say, look at that ox over there. It provides you, you know, your farm. No, no, no. He took them back to the scriptures because he knew that's where they were getting their solace. That's where they were getting their um, relief, their hope from was the scriptures. So that's why he took them back to Moses all the way to the beginning. And that reveals a lot about God, right? And that's why we need to be in God's word too. Why? Because God's words are powerful. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, we will never hung be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So it's the time of the Passover. They have to break the bread and drink the wine. And so he says, if you believe in me, you'll have eternal satisfaction for your hunger and your thirst. Beautiful words indeed. Now I get comfort in remembering all that God said in his word and what he revealed with his actions. He delivers provides for, and heals us to this day. That's beautiful, isn't it? A good reminder. True bread from heaven. So what about you? Reflect on this for the rest of the week. How has Jesus been the answer to your prayers of deliverance, of provisions, of relief from grief and anxiety over your life? Take time this week to remember how God provided for his people during the wandering in the wilderness and that he has not changed. He's still going to provide for us. He's still going to provide for you. Now, I like to look back and think of not only how God provided the actual physical things that I needed, right? Money, food, insurance, a job. But I also like to reflect on how he provided that peace when nothing else did. When my husband wasn't able to calm me down, when my job wasn't able to do it, you know, when my parents couldn't do it. And I just sat there wondering, how is this problem going to be solved? I was just talking to my husband about that the other day, um, back all, all the way back to college when I was having trouble in college. And it was wonderful to just reflect on that time, the time of darkness. It was painful. It was difficult. A great time of stress. But then I remembered, but then God did this, and then he did that, and then he provided here, and he provided that. And I remember the relief that came when I cried out to God, and he heard me and answered my prayer. And that's what I long for you to have, is that peace that passes all understanding when the things of this world don't provide it anymore. You may have been getting all this peace and satisfaction from your job, but then something changed and uh oh, now it's stress. Or from this car and uh oh, it broke down. Or this, you know, your husband or your partner and uh oh, that person failed me. Your best friend, uh oh, that person failed me. And so what you need to do is turn your eyes upon Jesus and slow down. And remember, take time to remember all that the Lord has done for you because he has never disappointed you. And in the lesson, I asked you to take some time to write out a prayer of thanksgiving to God, praising him for all that he's done. It's important for Christians to do this. Sometimes we get so busy reading our Bibles, uh, finishing a Bible study, going to church, helping out in ministry. That we really need, we forget sometimes to just stop, really slow down, and take time to praise God. 
to praise God for what he's done for us and what he's going to do for us, right? Newness of life is awaiting us, all of us who believe. Now, Paul said there is no condemnation now for the Christian because of Jesus, that if we walk in the spirit, we don't have that condemnation anymore. And we walk in the light. So that is enough to be thankful for right there. If Jesus never did anything else for us from this moment on, we have that. We have that remembrance that he is going to provide forever. So it's important that Christians do that, that they remember the wandering in the wilderness all the way back in Exodus. And my husband just finished teaching a Bible study in Exodus. They went verse by verse. I think it took two and a half years for them to finish. So he loves going back and reading those passages to remember what God did. So take some time this week to write out that prayer thanking Jesus for his deliverance, his provisions, and the true bread from heaven that will never spoil, but it leads to everlasting satisfaction. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He's taking them back to the literal meaning of that manna and taking it and saying, this is the figurative meaning. It was me and I am right here before you. God in the flesh again, right before you. Isn't that beautiful? I thank you for joining me today, ladies, for this lesson one of our Bible study. And I hope that you've been blessed. And I look forward to our next lesson for the next I Am Saying of Jesus. And uh, uh, and I'll take a look at the chat, what was going on in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. But for now, let's pray and we can be about our day. And again, take some time to write out that prayer to the Lord and truly meditate on his word. I promise you, it is life changing when you do that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for each lady joining me here today. And for those who even who couldn't make it, Lord, and will be watching this later. I pray that you bless them with every spiritual blessing. They want to know more about you. They want to be transformed by the studying and reading of your word. And that's my prayer for them, that they would eagerly seek you every day to pray to you, to roll over all their cares to you, and to be in your word, because we know that's where true power and transformation comes from, being in your word. Thank you, Father, for this time. It's all because of you. And I, I know that each lady here has burdens on her heart, but she knows that you hear her and you know her. So go to her, let her know, you know what her prayer concerns are, and you are on top of it. And that's where the peace comes from, Lord, from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, ladies. You're awesome. And I'm going to take a look at that chat and see if I can answer those questions. You're welcome. Thanks, Janine. This is year number six. Can you believe it? Ah, I can't believe it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, ladies. Be blessed.